I'm up next. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, machine learning and give you some examples of what we've been doing at the library in this space. So, like all good library talks, we start with the definition. Um, we have two definitions here. One of machine learning, which is the subfield of computer science that according to Arthur Samuel in 1959, and now there's a, a key here, 1959, this has been going on for a very long time. It gives the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So this is where we give the computer some information and tell it about something and then we show it some more and it starts to make connections and it can start to predict. Slightly scary but um, got lots of options for us. It is different than artificial intelligence which is um, exhibited by machines. Now I guess in artificial intelligence there's the, um, you know, the, um, oh, the com the computers that are learning that are a bit scary and um, they start to make decisions, they get out of control and that can all be a bit scary. But I don't think that's where we're going in this space. This is about machines that actually learn about themselves and the environment they're in and make decisions based on that. Um, the use of machine learning, which is what I wanted to speci specifically talk about today, is in its infancy in cultural institutions in Australia, but the potential this technology promises is transformative. Machine learning can create huge data sets in just minutes, information that can be used in deep research and reuse, opening new avenues for the discoverability and access of cultural collections. So today I'd just like to show you briefly um, three projects that we're working on at the library that have all involved machine learning. So, you know, we've been into this, this space, but you might not have noticed that we've been doing it. The first one is um, image recognition, then we'll look at speech recognition and then some sentiment and text analysis that we've been doing. So automatic image annotation or tagging is the process by um, which a computer system automatically assigns metadata in the form of captioning and keywords to a digital image. Now this, this um, tool set, this uh, exercise is something that's really built for libraries. We've got a lot of images. We need a lot of uh, images tagged for discoverability. Um, you'll come across automatic image tagging in your everyday life. Facebook does it all of the time. That's how it works out who to tag as who in your photos. Um, there's other applications such as Instagram and Pinterest. They're all based on image recognition, um, based on um, you know offering you things for sale, helping you find images like this, that sort of style of thing. And then there's a new one that I came across called Smartify, which I quite love the title of, which is image recognition that's um, being used in European museums where the data sets are stored in a database, but you can look up the image by just pointing your phone at it and the painting, and it will give you the background of the painting and tell you all about it. We've been doing imaging, image tagging with UTS. Now, we've been working with the Global Big Data Technology Centres. We've been working with some serious computer guys, um, which has been a huge learning um, curve in itself for us. But we've established a, re a partnership with the, this Global Big Data Technology Centre at UTS. And what the purpose of this is to explore the application of mach machine learning to the work that the library does. One of the great challenges of digitising large photographic collections is how we describe these collections at the level that makes the content useful. For example, one of the photographic collections waiting to be digitised is the Australian Consolidated Press photographic archive of images dating between the 1920s to the 1980s from magazines such as Pix Magazine and Women's Day. There are around 28,000 images in this collection depicting social and everyday life in New South Wales. The challenge this presents in cataloguing is enormous, but if they are not well described, they cannot be easily discovered in our collections. So we need to find other ways of describing these, um, these sorts of collections. And so we're currently working with these computer scientists to see what machine learning might be applied to this program, and the results are encouraging. So in this process so far, we've taken 30,000 images from the Sam Hood collection. They're mostly predominantly black and white images. Um, from the 1930s to the 1950s, and they used 20,000 of these to train um, the system, and then we've used 10,000 of them in testing. So how they trained the system was, the, and the reason we chose this collection was it's already been well described by catalogers in the past. So these images have got individual subject headings, which is really important for it. 
And so they took 20,000 of those and the subject headings and showed the, the computer over and over again that this is a car, this is a horse, this is a dog, this is a building, these sorts of things. And then they took 10,000 and they ran them through and we compared them with the human labels that had been added to see how well we got, um, what sort of results we got. So we used 119, they're calling them labels, they're actually subject headings, we call them subject headings. Um, and over that we had a 78% overall precision, 49% um, overall recall, and the important one, a 60% overall F1 score, which means um, how well we think it did. So for the examples we've used, um, we took this photo, and so the blue stands for the matched labels, um, so that's where it got the same label as we did. The red stands for the ones that it missed, and the purple stands for the, a wrong prediction or a different prediction. So this one actually blows me away because the computer somehow rather worked out this was a game of cricket, um, which is sort of really on the edge of the machine learning because while machine learning is very good at picking up objects, so it can tell you cars, buses, trains, automobiles, those sorts of things, it doesn't do well with... Um, semantic things. So it could tell you that there was a whole lot of people on the street, but it couldn't tell you it was a parade. It could tell you there was a whole lot of people standing around a cake, but it couldn't tell you it was a birthday party or a wedding. Um, but this one, somehow or other, it worked out what cricket is. So this is very promising for us. Um, this one, it didn't understand about a library. Again, a library is more of a, a, an emotive description rather than uh, a direct description, but it still picked up the males, the people, and the fact that it was an indoor picture, which um, will be very useful for, for us in when we're cataloguing internal scenes versus external scenes. Um, and then sometimes it might add its own interpretations. So this um, collection here, it got mostly right. It doesn't cope well with um, children and females at this point, but it does cope well with males. Um, and part of this, I think, is because the collection in the 1940s, and this one's probably not a good example of it, but in the 1940s, men could be relied on to wear a suit and a hat. Women can't be relied on to wear the same thing two days in a row, so it's really hard for it to cope with because it's, it's just looking at the shape. It usually gets children, and it's gotten much better at getting children, but again, it has a lot of trouble pulling gender of children because, again, about clothing and context, it doesn't see it. But interestingly, it chose the word surf, which we didn't choose to give it as a heading. So the, the idea that this is now one tiny little bit ahead of us, um, choosing another word that we didn't pick up or didn't train it for specifically. So this project, I think, is really interesting for us. It um, gives us a lot of opportunity to look at how we might analyse large um, collections either for describing and cataloguing or even for when um, analysing collections that are being on offer. So we could go through a collection really quickly and see you know, what the main subject matter of the collection is. This uh, project is one that we're working on with UTS and we're moving forward. Um, one of the challenges for me in working with this is it's going to be and already is a, a, a very voracious consumer of photographs. So UE's APIs are coming into in that I need to get large numbers of, uh, large sets of photographs out um, in forms that they can feed. And one of the other differences in the project we're working here with UTS, um, which makes it different from, and as you know, Google does image recognition, lots of other commercial ones. The point of difference um, with our collections are that they're black and white and historic. And the Google data sets at the moment haven't learnt enough about what a car looked like in the 1940s or what a car looked like in the 1920s. And that's the challenge we're working with. So we're really particularly um, framing this project towards the historic end when women wore long dresses and big hats where um, buildings were slightly different and that sort of edge. And also with black and white because a large amount of image recognition in some of the modern tools is taking its information from changes in colour. And if you take strip the colour out of the photo, you've stripped a whole channel of information out. So there's another whole challenge for it. So this is a very exciting project that um, is underway at the moment and we'll let you know more about it when we have more to show. The second area of machine learning I wanted to talk about this morning was speech recognition. Um, and that's the ability of a machine or a program to identify words and phrases, spoken language, 
and convert them to a machine readable format. Um, this technology has been around for at least 20 years, but its actu accuracy is improved dramatically in recent years, and it's actually becoming very useful. Uh, I don't know any, if any of you worked with something like Dragon, naturally speaking, 20 odd years ago, and you'd, you'd try and tell it what you wanted to type, and that's where, when I was working with it um, next door at Parliament as we are exploring it for Hansard, we decided that science fiction writers were getting their names of things from because it just randomly chose words, scrambled letters. Um, was an extraordinarily frustrating exercise as you'd read it over and over and over again. But the, um, the ability for machines to recognise speech has become um, so much better. So we have it available to us on a daily basis. That's how Siri works. That's how Cortana works. Uh, Google the Google app that lets you talk into it. You might know if you've got an iOS phone, you can speak your um, input into SMS messages and things. So, and it is getting almost all of the time, it's getting it right. So our project on this is Amplify, and thank you to Jenna for the slides <laughs> and some of the background on this, but um, Jenna and I have done a bit of work on this in the first place was, We've taken our oral histories and we're looking at using voice recognition to create transcripts for them. As you've probably all heard in every speech that we've talked about, DEP, etc., we have 11,000 hours of oral histories and we cannot put them up online without transcripts if we want to meet our accessibility guidelines, aside from the fact that um, the oral history transcripts provide a rich data source on their own for working with all sorts of other things. But um, when we looked at this problem in the first place, it, you couldn't transcribe an hour of oral history in under five or six hours. So we were looking at a lifetime of people transcribing our oral histories just to get some of them up. Or if we were paying ordinary transcription companies, we were looking at millions of dollars. So the project looked around at various other ways of doing it and we've chosen to use VoiceBase, which is a, um, a voice recognition software company. Uh, they're the company that run things behind when you're, say, ringing a call centre and they say that your call may be recorded. That's the sort of technology that they're using. And so we can now put our oral history collections through those and an hour of oral history takes minutes to transcribe. And we get about an 80 to 85% um, accuracy rate in these transcriptions. And that's good enough for search and discovery. Um, there's been research done that if you put a, a transcription up with 85% accuracy, it's pretty hard to read, but it doesn't make any discernible difference in its discovery. So it makes um, our searching for these items is much more effective. But that's where then Jenna's crowdsourcing project comes in and we turn to the crowd to look to um, transcribe these collections. So it's currently we've done three, the Bridge Builders, um, we've done four, the Rainbow Archives, sorry, um, Gary Wotherspoon, who was a, an activist in the gay movement in Sydney in the 70s, I think. Um, so um, we've put these collections up and made them available and these are the sorts of interactions we're getting from um, people engaging with these collections. So you can see that by using the machine learning to get us the large chunk of the way, we have now suddenly got a very real solution to the transcription problems of oral histories. Um, and that's a very exciting thing for us to do. And also it will make large data sets available for people to analyse oral histories in ways that they haven't done before. So the third one quickly is um, sentiment analysis. And sentiment analysis is used for a variety of applications and a myriad of purposes. Companies use it and brands often utilise sentiment analysis to monitor brand reputation across social media platforms or use the web as a whole. Um, and it's used in call centres to see the, um, when they're doing political surveys to see the, the, you know, the thoughts of the people that they're talking to. Um, but the example I wanted to show you here is, um, it's called We Feel, and it, it's put together by um, CSIRO, and it's using this, this is the same team that put together Visi that are um, collecting our social media. And what they've got here is an online tool where you can look at the sentiment of tweets during uh, any given day and across the world, 
and they're analysing the attitudes that are in these um, tweets. And I think this is pretty amazing. If you look at it over time, you can see... Like I tried looking back at Trump's um, election. The sentiment that day was a bit all over the shop. Um, you can see it. yesterday was quite a happy day in Australia, so we're all moving fairly well. But um, it's just a really interesting way of a uh, first test of looking at the sort of information that can be gleaned from tweets, which are a good finger on the pulse of the, um, the attitudes of the community. The second one I wanted to talk about was also about text, but it's um, using information extraction. And this is about text analysis to learn and to extract a particular piece of information or data, for example, extracting addresses, entities, keywords. And the project here that um, we have here is a very interesting one. It was done by Monica Schwartz, who's a um, master's student in computing science at Monash, who approached us for access to some of the David Scott Mitchell books, and we gave her a set of 40 of the um, digitised David Scott Mitchell books about oh, nearly two years ago now, before they were available to anybody else, which was quite a challenge for us to get the data set together, and that's one of the things for us working in this space is we have to get much better at providing um, the data sets to people quickly and effectively. But what she's done here is taken those, the text of those 40 books from the David Scott Mitchell collection and extracted all the words and done just a simple word cloud, but it gives you an idea of the sorts of words that are available or that um, the occurrence of them. And you can see that these are early 19th century books, 20th century books, because man comes up larger than anything else. Um, but you can also then play, I can extract the word man from that data set and then see what the next most common words are. And the books with the, down the side panel, um, the books with those words occurring most are, the, are ordered in the order of which they appear. So that was about the text analysis. And then the other thing that she did with it, and this was all just an exploratory master's student's work, um, but the other interesting part was that she extracted all the images from those books and then um, is displaying the images, the context of the image, the book it came from in there. Now, this part is the part that I think is really exciting for us because, like the British Library, we've got millions of books with millions of images in them that have never been seen outside those. So if we could apply this same skill set to our the David Scott Mitchell collection for our own purposes, we could suddenly find images that have never sort of seen the light of day, new maps, new diagrams of the way things were described. And I think that's a really interesting piece of work for us. Um, the other um, purpose that Monica wanted to do this for was the challenge that full text collections will have on our searches. We won't be able to search just with Primo uh, across a full text search collection and get really meaningful results. There'll be, we'll need ways to filter this information because of just the sheer volume of the data and the swamping of results that will come if you just tried to run an ordinary search engine across 1.3 million pages of text and to come up with meaningful results. So there's a, a real area of challenge for us to play with. Um, that also is what the text of the David Scott Mitchell books look like. So she extracted that as well and just um, reformatted it on the page so that if your heart desires, you can read the whole book um, with that formatting. So thank you. Um, that was a very quick overview of machine learning, but that's where we are with the library. Um, and it's a very exciting space for us to be.